So yes, Xavier and Arthur, thank you very much to give me the chance to talk about the plantar lapidus plate and to give you the insight of the last 10 years. Uh, Paul Simons from Mainz, respectively, now he's in Wiesbaden, and I, we have started the um, Labitus <coughs> plantar plating system exactly 10 years ago. It was May, June 2010. And um, since uh, I'm doing the TMT fusion with the plantar plating, uh, I have to say that my thinking and my understanding of hallux valgus surgery and foot surgery uh, uh, is very much influenced this way, by, by, by this technique. And I just hope that I can share my experience with you with this little talk. Um, let me start with the quote by Paul Lapidus. Uh, he said, the immediately opened angulation between the first cuneiform and the first metatarsal causes the compensatory angulation open laterally between the big toe and the first metatarsal. That means that in 1934, Lapidus already knew that the focus on severe hallux valgus deformation lays in the TMT1 joint. This is the classic Lapidus fusion where he fused the TMT1 with just one screw and he used a transfixation screw between the base of the first and the second metatarsal. The aim was to reduce the intermetatarsal angle and to restore the medial column. These days, we wouldn't do it this way because it's just not stable enough. I think they all had a, had, had a cast for half a year. Um, so what, uh, the, the indica what is the indication today? The indication is not only a large intermetatarsal angle like here. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's the instability. And we always talk about, oh, sorry, about the instability. How can I see instability? I always have a look on the sole of the foot and you see here the hyperkeratosis under the second and third metatarsal because the first ray is not stable and you, they walk on the, on the second and third metatarsal and secondary, they get an arthritis in the TMT2 and 3 joint. We're gonna see that later on. So you get an overloading of the MT2 joint and sometimes this is a, is a picture I took of, of the team, that's a plantar aspect of the TMT1. You don't see that very often, but you see that he, she had, or this patient had a rupture of the plantar uh, capsule of the TMT1 joint. So what is instability? Uh, you can, you have to examine the patient and you fix the second till fifth metatarsal with one hand and you test the agility of the first uh, Ray, you go up and down, and a lot of people try to, or they attempt to, to make a definition, either descriptively or quantitatively, and I think this is just too difficult to measure, and I think it's a matter of experience, and I just want to show you this here, and this makes it just very obvious. I hope, um, just give me a feedback if you can see this video. Xavier, is it working? Yes, it's working, yeah. Okay, thank you. So this is instability. I think we don't have to talk about instability now if you see this. So the mobility of the TMT1 joint is, so that's the same patient. The, this, the range of motion of the TMT1 is 1.5 degree which is very little. So it's almost like an orthodesis. And if it's mobile like, mobile like this, we talk about instability. If you examine your patient, ask him to do an eversion or an abduct, uh, um, a pronation of, of the foot, and you will see uh, some patients, uh, the, the, the perineus longus will have a locking effect and will block the TMT1 here because you see here, here is the attachment of the perineus longus tendon, which can stabilize the, the um, the TMT1 joint. What else are indications? An elevation, an elevation, not, not necessarily in, an insta, instable elevation. Uh, you see this, this was a lady, uh, she had hallux, val, val, hallux valgus surgery before in this area, but they did not take a, an X-ray weight bearing from the side and you see this elevation. So the toe has no chance of, of dorsal flex here. And so we just plantarize it. 
And here, this is an example, it's another video. And you see here, this is a fixed elevation. Yeah. That's the same patient. It's fixed. And if, the, if you have this fixed position, I think a lot of patients get hallux rigidus by a fixed elevation uh, of the first metatarsal. And those people, they get arthritis. Um, so first you have a hallux limitus and later on you get your light and later severe rigidus. Like here, there was a young man and it does not look that severe, but you see the base of the first toe is not able to dorsiflex and compensatory the tip of the toe dorsiflex. And if you take the AP picture, you see he had arthritis. What we did, we did a plantarizing lapidus alphidasis, which shortened the first ray just a little bit and we plantarize it. And then he could move the toe much better than before. Um, another indication is arthrosis of the TMT1, either primary or secondary. Primary here, the typical picture with cysts. And Secondary, you get like a de degeneration of the joint if you have, a, have a, a, a very strong instability. Another indication is the flexible sagittal flat foot deformity. I think lapidus is one, one part of flat foot um, correction. Give this example. This is a patient. You see the tarsal metatarsal ankle in the AP view is not correct. He had a very unstable TMT1 with a, with a, a supination position of the MT1. And later on, we did the hind foot correction first. And when we did this, we got a very nice correction of the uh, tarsal metatarsal axis. And then we plantarized uh, the first ray. I show you. This year, this was before the operation. So first we did an, uh, um, an Evans osteotomy and then a, plantar, a plantarizing MDO. And finally, a, a plantarizing or um, a correction of the forefoot supination. If you don't have an hallux valgus or arthritis, you just do a cotton osteotomy. So then you don't need the, the lapidus fusion. But in this case, it's, very, it's a very nice procedure. What else? For me, piece adductus. I think people talk not enough about piece adductus because hallux valgus with piece adductus is a very severe problem. And I will show you some pictures later on where the procedure just failed because it was not, it was underestimated. So this was a young man uh, with an adductus foot. And if you do a lapidus, sometimes you're lucky, you can press it over. If they have arthritis in the team T2 or three joint, it might open up a little bit. But I think if you do an uh, lapidus orthodesis here, um, the joints don't have a big chance to move more medially. So it, it just blocks the first column in the correct way. So a ductus foot with hallux valgus is a good way. If it's too severe, you really have to think about surgery in general, but in this case, it was a nice indication. What else? Diabetic foot and rheumatic foot, you have to stabilize the medial column because especially in rheumatic foot, you get all those luxation of, of the joints and so you can, you can, you can uh, stabilize it. Either, especially in rheumatic foot, I, sometimes I do, I do a double orthodesis like TMT1 and MTP, but if you can save the joint, it's just great for the patient because it's easier for him to walk on. Neuropathic caused uh, deformities. This was a young lady with spina bifida and someone tried to fix the hallux valgus with a base osteotomy and it's just not stable. So for me, orthopathic foot, you really have to do fusions because they really last. I think the biggest field of labidus is besides correction of the large intermetatarsal angle and the instability is revision surgery and salvage procedures. I wanna show you some examples. So this is a base osteotomy and we fixed it with a lapidus or a scarf osteotomy failed. It was a young lady, I remember that one. In Germany, there are still some people doing Stoffella. I just did that three weeks ago and she had a lot of pain here. 
And yeah, and this is an underestimated uh, Halux valgus with PS adductus. You see, it did not really work. And so she had a lot of pain. And so finally I did a lapidus. I had to reverse this here. And I, I did two closed wedge osteotomies on the base of the second and third metatarsal base. Decompensated forefoot instability is also a good uh, indication for lapidus orthodesis. I did double osteotomy, uh, double orthodesis here. So you see, we have a really wild, wild field for, for labidus orthodesis. So even here, this was a, a young lady with a Lis Frank uh, injury and she had a lot of pain. And um, yeah, I had to fuse the TMT1 and TMT2 and at the same time, uh, the intercuniform because she had a severe arthrosis here. And I did it by, by the plant to play, just diagonal here and elevating diagonal over to the cuneiform intermedium. And so I could fuse it to put some spongiosis graft in between. So this is a very nice indication to use uh, the plantar plate as well. And another one is hallux valgus with the instability here. Like I just mentioned before, you very often you have severe arthritis in the TMT2 and TMT3. So I do a plantar labidus orthodesis here and um, orthodesis of the TMT2 and 3 uh, with these dorsal plates. So you see, we have a lot of indications. We have very few contraindications like general contraindications, severe diabetes, uh, artery occlusive disease, a strong smoker, a very short first ray uh, and infections, uh, soft tissue infects and bone infections, pronounced oste osteoporosis and be careful with uh, non-compliant patients. Complications in the beginning, oh, in general, hallux valgus surgery, the patient, I will mention that later on again, uh, they really have to practice. They have to practice because they all fight against restriction of mobility. Um, excessive shortening in the first ray, we we'll always shorten the ray a little bit by uh, Ernst Ortner from Austria, he did a research case uh, report and he said about four to five millimeters, which is very, very much. So you really have to be, be careful because otherwise you might uh, uh, produce a transfer metatarsalgia. And when you resect, you also have to be careful not to plantarize too much. If you plantarize too much, they get, hi they get hyperkeratosis under the MTP1 and they get a, hy get a hyper extension of the D1 and they are not able um, um, to, to walk over the forefoot because the repulsion forces is just reduced. Um, elevation of the first ray is just the opposite. Um, pseudotrosis, non-union, I will talk about that later on. Implant loosening, breakage, uh, loss of correction, relapse is rare. Tealy anterior tendon, uh, I know especially the guys in the US, so they're afraid of this. I will talk about that later on to, to um, encourage you a little bit. Avulsion fractures, we save that problems as well base fractures, and intercuniform inter instability. Uh, I just want to go back to the classic lapidus fusion. Uh, we saw that before. And now I want to tell you a little bit um, the development of the fixation procedures. So this was in 1934, and it was way before my time. And uh, when we started, we start with screws and K wires, screws and staples. And so this was one of my first lapidus orthodesis about 18 years ago, two crossing screws. It was in the year 2000. Um, and then the era of locking plates started in the 2000s. Ernst Ordner, I just mentioned from Austria, he started with his step plate, locking step plate without the compression screw. We put that on the dorsal uh, foot and the patient had complaints about the plate. So we started to put the plate more dorsal medial and a leg screw. And finally we ended up in the, in, in the medial, on the medial side of the foot. So we did that until 2010. And then 2009, 2010, uh, Paul uh, and I, we started with a um, <clears throat> plantar plate. And I just wanna uh, give you or explain you the idea. The idea is the, the is based on the ligament tension of the foot. We have like static stabilization 
um, structures in the foot. We have the plantar aponeurosis, we have the ligamentum plantar longum, and we have the spring ligament. They stabilize the foot. And when you step on your foot, especially on your forefoot, uh, you have destruction forces on the plantar aspect and you have compression forces on your dorsal aspect. And everyone who operates on feet, you know that the bone on the plantar aspect is softer than the dorsally. So the idea or the purpose of the plantar plate is to neutralize the plantar destruction forces and to reinforce the dorsal compression. So this is, these are the, the first pictures uh, we took or Paul took. Um, this is a radius plate uh, on, the, on the team T1. And so this was the first te uh, template we, we, he, he made. And um, so this was the first plate. We worked, we worked many years with this one. And um, yeah, and we gained a lot of experiences. And finally, in the year 2000, now this is a nice gadget. In the year 2017, uh, uh, we, we refined the plate. And it looks pretty similar, but um, I just want to show you what we changed. The plate now is a little bit more rigid than, than the old one. And, whoops, and um, what was bothering me, the, the, the space in between the second and the, the third hole was too short. So, so this is now, this is longer. So it's easier to adjust the plate just under the, the arthrodesis. This helps you a lot during the operation. Um, the third thing we've changed is that we, we um, made the oblong holes longer. So it's easier when you do your reverse screw. Uh, if for the orientation, it's, it's, much, it's much easier. Um, the fourth point is it's, it's less curved than the other one because people, uh, th this edge of, of the plate was interfering sometimes. And I think about three to four to five percent of the patients would take out the plates after a year because the plate is disturbing them, but just in this area. And so it's less curved. So I think we will have less uh, uh, implant removals. And another advantage, the fifth advantage, is we have three different sizes. So if you have a male with a very large foot or a lady with a very little foot, it's good to have, to have different sizes. In general, I would say 95% you work with the, with the normal size, but it's good to have. So now I just want to show you the surgical technique I use, I do. So I do a medial cut, not, not a dorsal medial cut. Open up the capsula. And here you see already there's arthritis. And uh, I always take off just a very little bit of this here. And um, I do this not only to have to, to take it off, <laughs> uh, I need it when I do my reposition because I know this is my vertical axis. And I also take off the dorsal part. Um, because so it's easier to see the DMMA or the parser angle and I avoid an impingement later on. I do my lateral release. And this is uh, the handle of my scalpel. So this is very soft and it's very easy to, to separate the correct layer between the tibial anterior tendon and the capsula and the soft tissue and the uh, musculus adductor, like you can see here. Uh, that's the joint. You have to take off the, the, the capsule here. And then you just resect the, the, the surface of the joint very, very little, as, as less as possible. And you always go perpendicular to the axis of the MT1. And um, be careful not to make too much inclination because you plantarize a lot. You have a very strong leverage effect by working here. And um, then you take it out, go down here, take everything out. And when this is, is, is everything is out, it's easy to um, bring the first metatarsal in the correct position. So my reposition is on the... Con con, uh, convex joint of the cuneiform. And here you see, I need this 
a vertical axis to know I can press it over, I'm in the correct dimension. And before I fix it later on, I always uh, palpate the plantar aspect to see if it's too low or it's not, uh, or it's too high. So again, just resect very little here. Usually it looks like this. Oops. And um, then I drill holes first on the, on the planter part. And then I do, I, I do crisscross chiseling on the planter aspect, then on the dorsal aspect. Then I bring it in the correct position again. I fix it with the K wire, first planter, then from this side. And then I take um, um, this, K wire as a guide wire for the screw later on. And then I take an x-ray to see if it's in the correct position. Then I take the reamer. I, me I measure the length of, of the K wire. So I know what length I need for, for, for the screw. I drill just a little bit up to the cuneiform because the screw is very sharp and it's doing a good job. And if I take out the bone with, this, with, with, the, with the drill, um, the, 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 the screw might not have, has such a good grip. So I bring in the screw, take out the K wires so I can really bring compression on the orthodesis. See the K wire, take an X-ray, take an X-ray if it's the correct position. And then I bring in the plate. Uh, here, I will talk about that, that, that later. There you have the options of ex, uh, eccentric or uh, central uh, drill holes. Bring in non-locking, a little bit eccentrically here, non-locking. And um, I have those drill, those drill guides. Um, I don't know if this is working with the think single use. I, I think you have to use those because I use them later on here. This is the direction of the uh, NC1 joint. So if you bring in, if you bring in um, uh, the drill or the screw here, you might hit the NC1 joint. So I take this uh, drill guide as a, watch, watch this position of this drill guide. I, I bend it over. I bend it over a little bit. It's, it's possible, even if it's, it's, it's very rigid, the plate, but I avoid hitting the NC1 joint. And then I bring in a, a 16 uh, locking screw. So finally, it looks like this. We take off the bone. If you planterize a little bit, sometimes there's, there's bone overlapping. I take that off. And so it looks very smooth. Take an X-ray. And that's, that's the result. You see, it's a little bit planterized. So you have a very nice uh, uh, medial arch. And that's it. So I'm doing this procedure, or I'm using the lapidus plate for 10 years. And uh, I think to make a review, I have to, you have to ask you several questions. One is what are the major changes for the patient? We're not only talking about us, we're talking about the patient. Uh, the second one is what are the changes for myself as a foot surgeon by the plantar plate? And the last one is what have I changed about the operating technique within the last 10 years? So I think for the patient, they have a better comfort than before. We have a faster mobilization, uh, earlier full weight bearing without higher complication rate. We have less thrombosis because they walk earlier, less osteopenia by inactivity and they have less muscle loss. We have less irritation um, and less soft tissue problems because the plate is plantar and is not medial. We have a lower number of implant removals because of the positioning of the plate and the patients return to work much earlier than before. So I think these are a lot of advantages compared to the two crossing screws or to the medial plate. So what are the changes for myself as a foot surgeon by the plantar plate? Uh, Kayatan Klos um, and Drummond, they did some um, uh, investigations about the stability. And here we have, on each uh, uh, picture, we have two crossing screws 
Here we have a medial plate, here we have a dorsal plate, and here we have a plantar plate. And they could prove that the plantar plate with two crossing screws has the highest primary stiffness. Um, for me, I see that I have a very big reduction of non-union rate. Right now, I have a non-union rate about 1%. Uh, Markus Walter from Munich, he had zero. And if I compare this with two crossing screws 20 years ago, it was 12 to 20%. So it's a big advantage. Um, infection rate is reduced. If you see here, you have your plantar plate and you have your abductor muscle, which is covering the plate. To be honest, I, I never had a, a, a deep infection here. Probably you have a wound infection of the skin, but never down here because this is very well sealed by the muscle. The relapse rate is less because of the labitus procedure. It's not because of the implant, but I think the labitus procedure, in Germany, a labitus procedure is a very, very common procedure. Um, sorry, <laughs> uh, increased number of labitus uh, cases, like I just said, because of the good results, uh, a lot of people are doing labitus either with a plantar plate, medial plate, any kind of fixation, but the lapidus procedure is a very sustainable procedure with excellent long-term results. So now probably the most interesting part for you, uh, what have I changed about the operating technique within the last 10 years? These changes um, are results out of failure and complication that I experienced. I mean, everyone has to be honest and every one of us had made failures or had complications. And anytime when I, when I have visitors in, in the OR, I realize they are much more interested when I have problems and they're watching me very closely how I solve the problem than when I have two or three or four lapidus orthodases in a row and everything is running very easily. So this is more interesting for them. And um, we, I talked to a lot of other foot surgeons, so we really changed the technique a little bit, and I want to show you how we did it. So modification to optimize the or technique by considering occurred problems and complications. I had a friend of mine, um, or he's still a friend of mine, he had several avulsion fractures of the cuneiform, and we didn't know why. And finally, we saw that he always choose very, very long screws, bicortical screws, and there were, the positioning was too much medial. And you see this avulsion fracture here. So we changed that, this, we changed the, the screw position and uh, the length of the screws. And since then he had no avulsion fractures anymore. Um, the non-union rate, uh, Kaitan Kloos, Paul Simons and I, we did uh, the first uh, paper in 2011, one year after uh, implementing the plantar plate and the non-union rate was already 1.75. Now it's approximately 1%. So in the beginning, we start with the leg screw and two screws perpendicular to the axis, two in the MT1 and two in the cuneiform. And half a year later, Paul and I we met and we, 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 it was like, like parallel. We said, we, I changed the technique. Uh, and what we did, we, we used this screw as a reverse, as a crossing screw. So we do it here, and that's the reason why we we enlarge this oblong hole. So really, you, it, the orientation it's it's easier if if this hole is a little bit wider. And now we're doing this reversed crossing screw, leg screw, and two uh, locking screws here. What else did we change? Uh, in the beginning, I used a three point five millimeter leg screw. Uh, and now I have a 4.0, which is a little bit stronger. And the positioning of the leg screw I changed. So in the beginning it was diagonal, and now I am more horizontal. And if you remember, I said that the plantar aspect, the bone on the plantar aspect is softer than dorsally. And so I have a better grip with this screw uh, dorsally. So I use uh, now the leg screw as a horizontal screw. And what else did I change? In the beginning, we always oriented this screw to the medial part and now always go laterally. So this plate is, is medial plantar and this is dorsal 
lateral. So I really, I, I, it's like in a cage. I have, I have, I fixed the the the, the uh, TMT one joint with this construction much better than before. What else can you do? You can bring in the screw eccentrically. That's what I said. And if you bring that in, you really see you will see some fat coming out of the orthodesis because you get additional compression on the orthodesis. If I have sclerotic bone, especially in men. Um, I use a spongiosa graft uh, for the orthodesis. And if I have uh, uh, a non-union, I always take a, a tricortical bone graft from the iliac crest. I bring that in press fit and I take a leg screw in a different uh, direction than before. And then I take a medial plate. And uh, what else did we find out? Be careful with the periosteal blood supply. I saw some, some, some colleagues, they used the... Um, electric cautery for the preparation of the bone. And a friend of mine did that several times and he had a lot of non-union. And since he, he's doing it in a different way, not, not with the electric cautery, it's, it's, it's much better. Um, <clears throat> so that's the problem. Uh, I realized that the, the guys in the America, in the United States had, uh, are afraid of. And uh, in the beginning, in 2011, that was the paper of Cayetan Paul and me, um, we had a, a rupture of 1.72%. And um, there was a patient in 2013. And um, what I do, if, if I have the rupture, it's not possible to stitch it up, to bring, it to, bring the ends together. What I do, I, I drill a hole in the in a navicular bone. Um, it's, it's a very stable system to fix it in here. Um, the angulation might be not perfect, but I saw that lady last year, so six years after the operation, and she has no problems, problems at all. But that was in 2013. In 2013, we had a user meeting and you see we had seven surgeons and we had 2,750 cases and we had 1.5 till 2% non-unions. And this guy was the guy with the, uh, with the cautery and he is now close to zero. And there was me with the TBA under tendon and it was just 0.3. So um, we talk, I, I, I was so curious why those guys had no uh, uh, ruptures. And um, we talked about it and I changed my technique. I show you here. When we resect it, we preserve the fibers of the tibia and the tendon. Um, sometimes it's up to five to 10% coming up to the base of the first metatarsal. Sometimes it's less. But as, since I preserve those fibers, I show you here, we preserve the fibers, um, I have no ruptures anymore. And so I preserve the distal tendon attachment of the TB under tendon. And Christian Plas from Hanover, he did a very nice paper about placement of plantar plates for lapidus. And he, he described the plantar aspect of the TMT1 as the safe zone. He said uh, that there is, there, there, there is um, no risk because you don't touch any fibers of the of the TB under tendon and of the peroneus longus tendon. One problem which occurred just two or three years ago, and it's very rare. I think I just had three, two or three of patients, uh, is intercuniform instability and loss of correction. So this was a very nice correction, and the lady came. A, a few years later, and I thought, oh, it still looks good here, but the sesamoid bones are not at the correct position. What is this here? So I took a CT scan and I saw um, uh, this instability. So I have a relapse of, of a hallux valgus. And so since I saw this, each time I have the impression that there is an instability, I took the, an intercuniform hook test. I just take a, a hook here. I pull on the first metatarsal. And it's interesting that Fleming published a paper about that in 2015. What I do, I stabilize the, the, the intercuniform 
joint with a screw and you have different options. Either you take uh, your reverse screw over here to the cuneiform intermedium or you take a, 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 a solid screw over here. And I know the Americans uh, take uh, the lag screw directly over here. Um, you can do it however you want to do. Um, I don't like this one because I had some patients with neurological problems and um, there's always some slight motion between those two bones and this screw loosens up a little bit and you have to take it out later on. Um, the post-operative treatment for me, early mobilization with a low boot for six weeks, reset step under calcaneal full weight bearing for two weeks. That's just because of the soft tissue. They have uh, they often they have uh, they have uh, swelling uh, medication until let's say good walking they get heparin in Germany we have the S3 rules that means 20 kilograms weight bearing 20 degree mo mo mobility of the upper ankle you don't need heparin anymore so they get heparin for seven to ten days they get antiphlogistics like ibuprofen and patients they have. I explain what they have to do and I, I force them to do active and passive mobilization of the big toe, extension, flexion. Sometimes they need uh, manual lymphat lymphatic uh, drainage when there is a swelling, but they might need a walking school because they avoid walking over the first ray. They walk over, over the fifth method metatarsal and that might cause us problems later on. So, uh, and prophylaxis of possible follow-up issues like back pain, knee pain, and so on. So the conclusion for me for plantar lapidus fusion is that I have a great correction potential. Um, I have a wide field of indication and only very few contraindication. We, have, we allow the patient for er early weight bearing. We have a very high primary stability Additional subcapital procedures are possible and sometimes necessary. Be careful with shortening or plantarizing the MT1 too much. Uh, we have less soft tissue infections because of the plantar positioning of the plate. We have a smaller uh, uh, rate of non-unions. It's for sure, it's a challenging surgical technique with a learning curve. It's a sustainable procedure with a slight relapse quote, and we have excellent long-term long results.